Agrinusha Akorju. My name is Paul Cunningham and welcome back to day four of ISD Africa 2022. And um, following that very interesting presentation by Carla on um, space science and technology, we now have the third um, technology enhanced learning session of the day. So Safiso is going to start with a presentation on technology and pedagogical factors to be considered when building a resilience framework for integrating and using mobile technologies in South African rural schools. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Sifiso Lamini. I am a researcher at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. Uh, in Pretoria, and I'm also a PhD student at the University of Pretoria. I submitted to this conference a paper titled Technology and Pedagogical Factors to be Considered when Building a Resilience Framework for Integrating and Using Mobile Technologies in South African Rural Schools. So this paper basically emanates uh, from uh, PhD research, uh, which I'm currently undertaking. And uh, the aim of my PhD studies is to basically develop a, a resilience framework for integrating and uh, using mobile technologies in South African rural schools. Um, so I have conducted a scoping review uh, on this study, basically to look at uh, what were the effects of uh, the lockdown on uh, South African uh, rural schools. And I have uh, reviewed literature written between 2020 and late 2021 uh, to look at really what are some of those technology and pedagog pedagogical factors uh, which needs to be considered uh, when building uh, this resilience framework. The study was guided by one main research question, and which is, what are the technological and pedagogical factors to be considered when building a resilience uh, framework for integrating and using mobile technologies in South African rural schools? And, and this basically was motivated by an understanding that uh, one, when one introduces technologies in these rural schools, uh, one needs to follow this framework which will ensure that uh, the introduction of this technology will lead to sustainability and lead to the school being resilient in using uh, mobile technologies uh, for teaching and learning. So basically uh, the framework would have to look at, at the technological and pedagogical factors to make sure that these are factored in when building um, the framework so that the framework would actually result to a successful introduction and use of mobile technologies uh, in these schools and it would be done in a way that uh, uh, promotes uh, resilience. So the, the global spread of, of the coronavirus had a very devastating um, effect um, in, in South Africa, uh, particularly um, in the rural schools in South Africa. And, 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 and this did not only happen to, to South Africa alone, uh, but mainly schools around the world um, suffered as, as, as a result of countries implementing um, the lockdown uh, restrictions. Uh, and in South Africa, on the 23rd of March, um, the government implemented the first phase on uh, of lockdown, uh, which meant that the kids could not go to school, and uh, major reliance was really uh, put on using uh, mobile technologies, and this presented a very serious challenge uh, for rural schools in a number of ways, and one of them being the fact that uh, some of the teachers in the rural schools were not taught how to teach or were not trained on how to teach using uh, mobile technologies. And also, um, not all rural schools had access um, to ICT infrastructure, which could be used uh, for teaching and learning. 
and also when looking at the homes of, of some of the kids uh, that come from rural schools, not all of them had access to internet, would, would, which, would in, which would enable the interface between the teacher and the learner, and, and let alone um, submitting uh, tasks to the teachers using online platforms. So the short notice and unplanned closure of schools due to the coronavirus left millions of students out of school, uh, leading to reliance on mobile technologies for teaching and learning, and which created a, a very big challenge uh, for kids in the rural um, schools. Um, so the devastating effect of that was felt really by those who come from resource-constrained uh, environments as they could not keep up uh, to the learning practice when compared to their urban counterparts. So the study had two objectives, and the first one was to identify the challenges experienced by learners in rural communities uh, during the lockdown. And the reason for, for looking into those um, challenges is to make sure that um, the framework covers um, a broadly uh, a number of challenges which a school may encounter when uh, implementing mobile technologies uh, for teaching and learning. And the reason for that is to also provide guidelines in terms of how to deal uh, with those challenges or factors that can be used to mitigate those challenges. The second objective was to identify the technology and pedagogical factors to be considered when building a resilience framework for integrating and using mobile technologies in South African uh, rural schools. And the reason for that was to say, when building the framework, what are those factors which are, are only dependent on the technology? And what are the factors that are dependent on the pedagogy? And uh, the purpose of this is basically to make sure that the framework not only looks into the technology, but to also look at the ped pedagogical factors. So to understand these factors, the scoping literature review on the use of ICT to support teaching and learning during lockdown was conducted. And uh, the scoping review focused in two areas. Uh, we took an international focus to look at what did schools around the world uh, do to uh, deal with the effects of using uh, mobile technologies for teaching and, and learning uh, during the lockdown. And uh, then we narrowed down the focus to South Africa. And when looking at South Africa, we looked basically on uh, the rural schools as to what were the, some of the challenges uh, for the rural schools uh, in relation to the pedagogy and, and using mobile technologies. So the major outcomes regarding the challenges experienced by learners in rural schools during the lockdown uh, was divided into uh, two uh, based on the findings from the literature. And the first one is the technology related challenges. And the second one is uh, context and resource availability. In terms of technology-related challenges, um, it was clear from the literature that uh, the culture of embracing technology and using the technology for teaching and learning uh, is critical uh, or was critical uh, when schools had to use mobile technologies for teaching and learning. So basically, literature indicated that if schools did not uh, have the culture of using mobile technologies, they could not only start during the lockdown and, and use mobile technologies. So it's only those schools that were already using mobile technologies uh, for teaching and learning that were uh, successful in, in using uh, online platforms for teaching and learning during uh, the lockdown. Uh, and the second factor was that uh, in relation to technology is that Teacher training uh, is a very important component when using mobile technologies for teaching and learning. So only teachers who have received prior training on how to use mobile technologies for teaching and learning were able to
to use mobile technologies uh, during lockdown. And also in relation to technology, um, availability and access to technology was a very important factor um, because um, some of the learners did not have um, technology available at home. So even in cases where um, schools were embracing technology use and teachers had the sufficient uh, training, but it, when kids did not have or when learners did not have access to technologies at home, uh, that brought uh, a challenge uh, for the teachers to use online platforms uh, to teach the learners. And in terms of the context and resource availability, uh, it came out more on the literature that um, the urban schools in South Africa used uh, technology for teaching and learning more than the rural schools. And that can also be attributed to availability and access to technology. Uh, which most uh, uh, rural uh, uh, learners did not have access to. And also it came out that mobile technologies thrive in a, co in a context that promotes the use of technology in a classroom. And, and lastly, that access to connectivity is equally important. So even in cases where the learners had access to um, ICT devices at home, but if they did not have access to the internet, uh, then they could not uh, submit tasks uh, to teachers or, uh, or have access uh, to the content that the teachers want them to have access to. This slide basically uh, summarizes uh, the barriers of building resilience of using mobile technologies in South African rural schools. Uh, and these uh, are both technology and, and pedagogical factors. So um, access to mobile technologies um, is one of the barriers uh, of building resilience of using mobile technologies in rural schools. And, 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 and in terms of access to mobile technology, the two important factors is basically the availability of technology. So the school needs to have access uh, to, of, of access to mobile technologies for teachers and learners to use. And also the, the notion of appropriateness is very important, that the, the technology needs to be appropriate uh, to the teaching and learning environment uh, for teachers and learners to use. And then the pedagogical schools, uh, pedagogical skills looks at uh, utilizing available technologies uh, for learning. So um, the teacher needs to have the skills uh, to use the technology, but not only for the sake of using the technology, but the teacher needs to have the skills to use the technology for teaching and learning. And, uh, and, and lastly, connectivity is one of the most important factors uh, when uh, introducing mobile technologies in school, especially in cases where learners would have uh, to use the devices uh, remotely or have an interface with a teacher through uh, the internet. So internet access is an important factor and also a, a stable connectivity is also a factor. And when one looks at all these factors um, outlined in this slides, these are the factors which most rural schools are basically having uh, a problem of accessing. So the study concludes that uh, rural schools, especially those in resource constrained environments were greatly disadvantaged uh, by the 2020 lockdown. Um, even in schools where the technology was available, the absence of uh, the pedagogical skills made the technology useless. The implementation of technology in rural schools requires appropriate pedagogical skills on how to teach using mobile technologies. And lastly, uh, building uh, the resilience of using mobile technologies uh, for rural schools is dependent on the alignment between technology availability, teacher training, and access to connectivity. That
Um, thank you very much, Safiso. Um, so can you talk us through what percentage of South African rural schools were actually able to take advantage of mobile technologies and what distinguished those schools in terms of their ability to uh, have prior access of use of mobile technologies? Um, a good day and thank you for your question. Well, the, the schools were not really classified in terms of numbers. Uh, because this was a scoping literature review. So um, the literature looked at um, uh, published um, um, articles and papers on the effect of uh, the COVID-19 on South African rural schools. Uh, but based on my understanding of the saturation of ICTs or mobile technologies in, in, in uh, South African rural schools, uh, the number is still a very little. And then uh, even in cases where the schools have access uh, to this technology, uh, teacher training is not one of the things uh, which gets prioritized when uh, providing these schools with ICT. And that uh, is what actually brings the problem. Uh, thank you. Um, it occurs to me that if one of the issues is bandwidth related costs, and since, um, as we know from previous presentations this week, TV white space innovation in South Africa is relatively advanced compared to some other countries in the world, that might provide some opportunity to get over that barrier. I appreciate that you still have the device barrier, but at least it could help in terms of reducing costs. Do you have any thoughts about that kind of idea of using um, bandwidth spectrum to create essentially free private networks for educational purposes? Yes, um, the, the, the challenge uh, with most of the South African deep rural schools we have worked in um, is that um, even in cases where the technology is available, but the actual infrastructure uh, to connect the schools to, to the internet is, is, is not really that saturated. Um, in previous years, we have used uh, wireless mesh networks, and it, 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 in, in some of the areas, for instance, in the eastern part of, of South Africa, in the Eastern Cape, the mesh networks had a, a number of problems. Uh, one, because of, of strong winds, the, the antennas would sometimes go out of alignment and, and all that, but we still need more um, uh, connectivity uh, technology solutions to try and keep um, the schools connected to the internet. So in deep rural, in deep rural areas, connectivity is, it remains um, a great challenge, but there is ongoing research really in terms of what are some of the best connection uh, models that we use, we can use for these schools. Uh, also in the Eastern Cape, uh, about three years back, we we're also busy with one of the projects in ICT4E and uh, we use satellite connection. And it, it's basically a very, expensive uh, method of connecting the schools and especially when you try to hand over the project uh, to the department of education to continue with the legacy they really cannot cope uh, with the cost of that no i mean i think those kind of projects you might do them as a proof of concept but in terms of actually trying to do something meaningful it, it doesn't make any economic sense at all yes. does anybody else have any other questions or comments for, for safiso in which case, thank you very much indeed. And the next presentation is Jovita, uh, who's going to be talking about gamifying learning in high schools, perceptions of students in selected African countries. Good day, everybody. My name is Jovita Mateus, and I'm here to present our um, paper titled Gamifying Learning in High Schools, perceptions of students in selected African countries. This study was done by myself, um, Dr. Jude Osakwe, Dr. Gloria Iowa, as well as uh, um, Dr. Martin Uyapake. Myself, Dr. Jude Osakwe, Dr. Gloria Iowa are from the Namibia University of Science and Technology here in Namibia, while Dr. Martin Uyapake is from Ghana Communication Technology University in Ghana. Um, for this presentation, I'll take you through the introduction. I will then go through um, the adoption of gamification. I will then discuss some of the research gaps 
our study aims and objectives, and then the literature review, the methodology that we have used to conduct this study. Um, I will then take you through the results and the findings, some recommendations, conclusions, and references, and there will be time for questions. Okay. To start off, um, so we are saying today learners are accustomed to innovative technologies, which offers them a variety of learning techniques that they can adopt in their learning processes. As Core et al. Um, refers to them, digital natives, these type of learners are used to the digital language of computers and the internet, where they are exposed to video games and other interactive devices and software. This exposure has, a, has in increased their inclination to explore the world of computer games. Therefore, gamifying the learning engagement and processes through this medium is a welcome development for research engagements. Hence, we took up an opportunity to do this kind of study. Um, when we are talking of um, gamification, there's actually quite a number of definitions that are out there, but once the ones that we thought are very um, interesting are as follow. Gamification technique came from the process of game thinking and game mechanisms to engage users and to solve problems. It is also referred to as the use of different methods such as mechanics, framework, and dynamics to provide the desired behavior that is now being used in various areas of life. Okay, um, gamification so far has been adopted in various fields. These include businesses, fitness, and health, just to mention a few. The role gamification play in education can therefore not be overemphasized. Um, Dieter Ding and Lenders noted that gamifying education and learning dates and learning dates back to the psychological learning theories. So some, here are some of the research gaps that really motivated us to conduct this study. Um, there are sufficient studies exploring gamification for learning in high schools in other parts of the world, as well as systemic review on the role of gamification in learning. This is according to to Mura, Yan and Kim 2014. However, the same cannot be said within high schools in an African context. So there is um, there's really much research that needs to be done in Africa to, to, you know, to investigate and understand how gamification can actually um, improve the way we conduct teaching and learning in high schools here in Africa. Therefore, our study aims and the purpose of this study are as follow. Firstly, considering the, the research gaps, we intend to we intended to investigate how high school learners perceive the use of gamified learning within African countries. And secondly, the study aims to offer suggestions based on the challenges that have been found on how to develop appropriate technologies and techniques for gamification to enhance learning in African learning institutions. And lastly, this study contributes to the current literature on gamification from an African perspective. Um, gamification, when it comes to gamification research and education, we are saying that um, um, literature has has done a lot on education and learning. I can't read this. Please. Sorry. Literature has revealed that education and learning come out as the most common context of empirical gamification research. Varying uh, types of gamification techniques have recently been used as forms of reinforcement strategy to gamify learning experience techniques such as points, leaderboards, challenges, budgets, and levels. 
The use of gamification techniques in the school curriculum can therefore help offer an inclusive activity as it will enhance students' sense of competition, interaction, as well as motivation. Um, there are a lot of reasons or motives on why gamification has been used in teaching and learning. And here are some of the motives. Dicheva et al. noted that gamifying learning environment with appropriate gaming techniques will enhance learners engagement and learning experience. And also educational gaining techniques may also offer a powerful tool for knowledge acquisition, problem solving skills, collaboration and communication. This therefore means that gamification is a motivational element in the learning processes. Although there are a lot of benef uh, benefits that are associated with um, gamifying education, there are quite a number of critics that are out there. So here we have highlighted a few. Some researchers argue that number one, gamification techniques cannot offer the best option on students' learning outcomes. And they also argue that gamification could not derail, could derail learning with so many distractions and competitive stress. And finally, there's also criticism that says that um, gamification does not consider some learners' pedagogical needs. Um, here are some of the literature review or some of the works that we have reviewed throughout this study. So gamification in learning has been deeply explored and students have been found to have a positive attitude towards using gamification for learning. It is also believed that um, gamification is able to increase students' engagement. Some works that have been done also proves that it, it enhances students or learners' performance, and it also rescues students from stress, and it further makes learning fun and interactive. And finally, gamification um, offers an effective non-formal learning environment that helps learners to practice real life situations and challenges. These are some of the benefits that came through as we were reviewing existing literature. Um, when it comes to Africa and the use of technology, it has been noted that Africa is the second largest continent that uses mobile technologies in the world. This is according to a, to a report by Africa in Focus in 2019. The Global Mobility Report also suggests that there's an 85% mobile subscription rate in Sub-Sahara Africa, which is quite a promising number. This figure is also expected to reach 100% by 2020 and 105 increase by 2021 with over 1 billion subscription. So Africa have, having made such an, a huge investment in technology, it will surely thrive in the area of gamified activities among the youth. Therefore, it is very empirical to develop and motivate the use of gamification um, for high school students or for high school learners to improve their learning skills, their learning capabilities, performance, and their experience. For this study, um, we have employed a qualitative research approach and survey questions were used as a means for collecting data from the participants. Um, survey data was collected from 525 participants from four different African countries, which are Namibia, Nigeria, Ghana, and Kenya, therefore uh, contributing to a response rate of 65.63%. The distribution of survey questions that were specifically targeted at and randomly distributed to high school learners is as follow. In Namibia, 
um, 200 questionnaires were distributed. 200 questionnaires were distributed in Nigeria, 200 in Ghana, 200 in Kenya, making up a total of 800 questionnaires. However, from Namibia, only 102 learners responded, 182 from Nigeria, 129 from Ghana, 102 from Kenya, that's giving us a total of 525 um, questionnaires received. And here are the corresponding um, percentages. The collected data was uh, therefore descriptively analyzed using SPSS. So here are some of the findings. Um, so when the questionnaires were sent out, or the surveys were sent out, there are a couple of questions that were asked, and one of them are as follows, or some of them are as follows. When students or learners were asked if they are motivated when a teacher uses technology in class, 96% of the learners indicated that they always feel motivated, and 63 of the 96 mentioned that they were very motivated while the remaining 33 just were just motivated. However, 4% of the learners disagreed that they are motivated when their teachers um, uses technology in class. And when they were asked if they believe if they can use educational games to learn, 56% per, uh, of the learners believe that yes, they can. While 20% um, of the learners indicated that they really did not know much about uh, the use of educational games to learn. And 24% of the learners indicated that they had no knowledge of the use of educational games, which is quite interesting. And when they were asked to explain or indicate if they constantly use educational games in class, 11 of the learners um, indicated that they use educational games in the class all the time, while 45 indicated that they only sometimes use these technologies. 35% of them indicated that they use them once in a long while, while 9% of the learners indicated that they do not use educational games at all. And moving on with the findings and our discussions, when the learners that participated in the study were asked, um, if they want educational games to be incorporated into their daily school activities, 76% indicated that yes, they do want and they're interested to see that work, while 15% learners um, display that they do not uh, want educational games incorporated into their daily school activity, and 9% of the learners indicated that they are not sure whether they want um, educational games to be incorporated or they do not. And um, when they were asked to, 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 to express if the use of educational games enhances their active engagement in the classroom, 63% um, of the learners believe that yes, it does, while 50% of the learners also indicated that they always want to complete games when they play, and 54% indicated that they do not get bored when they play educational games. This was quite interesting to find out. And 19% of the learners disagreed um, when asked whether educational games can be used to enhance their classroom participation and interactiveness. Yeah, and lastly, um, when it comes to activeness, interaction, and collaboration through gamification, 68% of our correspondents uh, get more actively involved in courses that uses technology, particularly in educational games, and 72% further indicated that educational games make them feel connected to other learners, and 72% um, show that educational games allow them to collaborate with others easily, both in and outside the schools. 
moving on, um, still with the findings, um, when asked to talk about enhanced learning experience through educational games, there is quite a, a number of studies that have really, that have revealed that technology does enhance learning experience due to its interactivity and how it engages the learners. For example, 63 percentages of the students indicated that educational games help them to understand the subject material in a much more deeper way. And lastly, 61% even went further to reveal that educational games do motivate them to explore many topics that they may not have interest or they may not have understood before. And when it comes to enhanced learning experience through educational games, we have noticed that 68% of the of our participants indicated that technology indeed does allow them to do creative things and 69% further showed that technology impact them positively in their learning uh, process and achievement while 73 highlighted that um, technology does bring reality in the classroom. However, in as much as gamification and the use of technology in the classroom brings a lot of advantages and benefits. There's quite um, some critics to it and a few dangers that are associated with it. For example, they can be destructive tendencies of these games when they are being used in class. And from the respondents that we have gotten or the responses that we have gotten, there was an overwhelming agreement of about 82% of the participants participating indicating that um, educational games can indeed be destructive this also align these findings also aligns with some of the studies that have been carried out in the past indicating or stating that the use of games in education can indeed be distracting so considering these findings um, here are some of the recommendations number one Computer user skills, uh, it's very, we recommend that um, African schools or African, um, the education in, in, in Africa should make computer user skills as a compulsory subject in school. And they should also introduce the concept of gamification in learning to students from an early grade. And when it comes to computer resources, we recommend that governments and school administrators should equip their primary schools and secondary schools uh, within African countries, especially those that um, are based in rural areas with enough computers and enough resources for students to use. However, there's some cautions that should be given out. Um, while gamification in learning can have a positive impact there's also quite a number of control measures that needs to be put in place because like we have seen in the in the findings gamification in, in the classroom can be a bit distracting to conclude um enhancing students engagement and participation through learning activity is a vital for the development of learning capabilities and competencies and using games in the learning process could be effective as it has the potential to enhance and supplement techniques that are used in engaging learners in the classrooms. However, using gamification methods has its negative consequences in the class and in education in general. For example, um, when, it, when learners are using gamified methods, they may lead to distractions as noted by some of the respondents and therefore for gamification to be fully incorporated as part of the teaching and learning processes efforts will have to be made to analyze the advantages and the adv disadvantages of its use in order to achieve positive engagement and a better learning experience so that is it for for this study and here are some of the references that we have used and I thank you so much. If there are any questions, the floor is open.
Thank you, Javita. This was a very broad survey. Um, so I have a number of questions. Uh, firstly, um, one of the recommendations you made was in relation to um, national governments putting infrastructure and skills in place. So in South Africa, for example, um, there have been quite a lot of projects focused on putting infrastructure and skills in place across the school systems over the past decade. So what I'd be interested in you sharing is, from a Namibian perspective, are computer skills undertaken in either primary or secondary schools in Namibia? And then it would be important to differentiate between skills to use technology compared with computer science skills, because what you're talking about is people being able to use technology effectively. Thank you very much. Hello, maybe. Mary, maybe if I'm allowed to respond to the two issues you raised. Yeah, Martin, Tavita can't Martin. open her mic, can she not? Yeah, one of the co-authors of the paper. This is Dr. Oja Yeah, but if Javita, Martin, you can certainly answer the question, but if Javita can open her mic, it'd be good if she also answered some of the questions. I have a number of questions. So you okay, go ahead let, with this let, question, please. Let jo Jovita can go ahead and I'll come in. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. Can you hear me? Yeah, good afternoon. You're very clear. Okay. Um, to answer the first question, as it stands at the moment in Namibia, um, most government schools are not well equipped when it comes to computer resources. And in fact, um, computer user skills as a subject is not a mandatory subject, it's, it's an optional one. So it's, it's not a must that learners should go for it. They do go for it if they are interested, or, but in cases where they are not interested, they are not punished for it. Okay, thank you very much. And what I would appreciate is, is the delegates from other countries, if you could put into chat what the situation is in your country, because that would also be very interesting. So then my second question is, um, how challenging was it to engage with the students in this survey? And how were the research researchers able to verify that the respondents were part of the target group? So either Javita or Martin can answer that question. Um, I'm going to let uh, Martin, go first. Uh, all right, in terms of uh, collecting the data, what we did is uh, the, the questionnaires, uh, the instrument that uh, we apply to collect the data, uh, we put in a number of questions that uh, allowed us to do the, the responses. There were some uh, counting questions that made us to verify in terms of the responses that came whether they were consistent or they were not, the way there were some anomalies for us to pick, whether they were coming from the students or not. And again, uh, the data, considering the period in which we are collecting the data, it wasn't done physically. So one of the only ways we could do that was putting in those counting, uh, those counter questions to be able to pick up whether the consistency was there for us to know where it was coming from. Then again, uh, if you realize we, for each country, we're collecting data. We did a circulate an instrument of about uh, 200, but you realize that the response rate that came, they differed from country to country. There were some that we did not get the uh, responses from, but in general, the response rate was high for each of the countries. Thank you. And then um, my third question is, um, can you talk a little more about examples of areas where gamification proved to be less are more impactful? And why was this the case? And then also if Javita could answer from her perspective and then Martin can supplement it. Okay. Um, taking gamification into, into consideration, um, one of the subject or one of the areas where it's, it's most likely to be impactful is mathematics, for example, because at the moment, most of the teachers use conventional methods, which tends to not only be boring, but when you now apply um, gamified methods, learners tends to be more engaged and they also tend to be more curious, especially if you are playing games where they are awarded at the end of the day or they are awarded at the end of the activity. They, um, yeah, they, they spend time on, on their devices 
trying to score as much as they can because of the rewards. Okay, maybe to supplement that, uh, in terms of uh, the less impact, we have situations where when a teacher is applying a gamification, uh, instead, of, uh, the, instead of the students uh, or the trainers focusing on the uh, focus of that, uh, the purpose of him, uh, 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 using the game, the students rather get more engaged in the game itself, rather than the essence of, for instance, the mathematics you did. Instead of focusing on the output or what should be learned from that mathematical concept that should be taught. Even when the teacher wants to move on, the students get engrossed in the game because of uh, its addictive nature. So they lose focus in concentrating on even moving ahead with the teacher in terms of what he, wants, he or she wants to move on with. So sometimes it takes experienced teacher in terms of applying it to know how to keep the students going. Otherwise, the focus is on those are the little disruptions that we mentioned from the findings that they were present. Thank you. Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. So it'll be very important that the teachers have the appropriate skills and access to sufficient digital resources that they select the most appropriate games so that they can integrate it effectively into their teaching plan. That's correct. So Thank it's you. more a teacher issue than a student issue because the student that's will follow, correct. yeah? That's correct. We hope. <laughs> Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Naris, would you like to open your mic and uh, talk through your questions? So they're in chat. So Javita, you can see the questions now, so you can think about how you might answer. Okay. So Nar Narcisse, do you want to speak? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Narcisse Tala from the University of Chang in Cameroon. I'm really interested in the presentation of uh, uh, the present uh, the yes I've forgotten the name. Uh, anyway, Lisa. I'm really yes yes. Thank you very much. Yes. So I followed with uh, much more atten attention, and I appreciate the presentation. I have just two small questions. The first the first question is. Uh, do you th really think that the point of view of the teachers doesn't count? Because when you make a survey in the direction of the students, they give their point of view. I think that it is important to cross-check with the point of view of teachers. If we just have the point of view of one side, uh, I think uh, you don't master totally the problematic of uh, the, the, the situation. That is a, a point of view. Uh, I, have, I haven't read the document in total, so I don't know whether you have taken into consideration the point of view of lecturers or not, but that is my first question. Uh, did you administrate a, the same survey or a complementary survey to the teachers, uh, whether it is useful or not to, to, to apply gamification in, 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 student, in, in schools? And then the second question I have to ask is, uh, how was the survey administrated? Uh, from where were coming the results? Were they coming from urban city, cities, that is main cities, or were they coming from uh, rural cities? Because the point of view of students in rural cities is not the, the point of view of students in main cities, for example. They don't have uh, facilitations in uh, device access, that is in uh, uh, technology or electronic uh, devices access, for example. So those are my two preoccupations. If you have taken into consideration, please, you just have to clarify it to, to me. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, maybe if I may respond to the two questions. Uh, for in terms of uh, the uh, perspective, we focus on the students because uh, if you pick up uh, any technology that is deployed, uh, sometimes uh, the user and other stakeholders, if a stakeholder is not part of uh, the, the development of the technology, sometimes accepting the technology becomes a problem. So we're looking at gamification from the perspective of the student in this particular research. As part of the broader research, we'll definitely look into the teacher perspective. But for this particular study, we didn't look into the teacher perspective. Our focus was mainly on the student perspective to see what would be their reception or what is their perspective around it. 
And then in the larger picture, when we move on to collect further data from the teachers, then we see the teacher perspective. Even beyond that, we would also look at it from the other stakeholders, even like the school administrators, because in terms of uh, finances, they are those who go into financing the, uh, the infrastructure or technology that the gamification will eventually run on. Then to take the second question, uh, we needed to be sure that uh, we're dealing with uh, uh, a sample of population that uh, that uh, understood uh, well what we're trying to, uh, uh, the research that we're carrying out. Even you realize that some of the responses we got indicated that some students had no idea about gamification, though they had an idea of the use of uh, technology in, uh, in schools. So we rather collected data more from the urban areas than the rural areas. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm satisfied. Thank you. So if I don't see any other questions in the chat, so I propose that we move. Th so thank you very much, Javita and Martin, for your presentation and uh, sharing your knowledge. And now we'll move on to the next presenter, which is Francis. Thank you, everybody. So Francis is going to present determination of pre-phase equivalent circuit parameters of three-phase transformer using MATLAB Simulink. Good day, everyone. My name is Francis Katende. I'm a research student at the Namibia University of Science and Technology. Today, I'll be presenting my paper on the determination of per-phase equivalent circuit parameters of three-phase transformers using MATLAB Simulink. So, what was the motivation for writing this paper? Well, on the 11th of March, 2020, the first case of the coronavirus was reported in Namibia. A few days later, on the 28th of March, the country went into a full-blown lockdown. This meant that face-to-face -face classes had to be suspended now, after a brief hiatus, the university decided to explore online teaching platforms such as Microsoft Teams. Now, I'm sure you can already see the problem with that. The Electrical Machines course had several laboratory sessions, one of which is the three-phase transformer lab. Students could not come to the labs to perform the experiments due to the restrictions. Likewise, members of staff could not go to the university. Yet, the semester had to continue and grades had to be submitted. So, we devised a software lab using Simulink. Given the situation, the objectives became quite clear. The goal is to determine the per phase equivalent circuit parameters. First, a transformer needs to be defined within Simulink. Next, the two tests required to determine the equivalent circuit parameters need to be modeled within Simulink. The first test being the short circuit test and the second test being the open circuit test. The tests then need to be performed and results collated by the students for further analysis. Next, we look at the methodology. Figure one shows the simplified per phase equivalent circuit of a three-phase transformer. Here, REQ and XEQ represent the equivalent winding resistance and leakage reactance of the transformer respectively. The exciting branch components, RC and XM, represent the core losses and the magnetization reactance of the transformer core. VP and VS are the primary and secondary voltages respectively. IP and IS, represent the primary and secondary currents. The turns ratio is denoted by A. For bulk transformers, three phase, the Simulink three-phase transformer two windings is used. This is because it models a bank of three single-phase transformers connected to make three-phase, just like in the actual lab. We measure RMS values of voltage and current, just like on a digital multimeter. In figure 2, the output terminals of the transformer is left open, 
and full rated voltage is applied to the input terminals as per the open circuit requirements. In figure 3, the output terminals of the transformer are shorted. A reduced voltage is then applied and increased until rated current flows through the transformer. The reading on the P short circuit meter then represents the core losses. The equations for both short and open circuit tests are described here. Let's look at the open circuit test first. First, the conductance of the core loss resistor GC can be computed. The open circuit admittance YOC can then be computed. The subsistence of the magnetizing inductor is then computed. The magnetizing components RC and XM can then easily be computed by the equation. In short circuit tests, the series impedance referred to the primary side ZEQ can be calculated by the given equation. And then the equivalent winding resistance and leakage reactance can be computed by their respective equations. The turns ratio can be computed by the given equation as well. So what did we learn from doing all this? Well, Table 1 summarizes sample results students will get after performing their experiments from the comfort of their computers. With the information they, compute, they can compute several other variables including efficiency, voltage regulation, no load power factor, amongst others. The software lab session was successful. Each student had then each student had their Simulink model on their screen and they were able to play around with it to see the effects of changing different parameters. It also sharpened their MATLAB Simulink skills as they were assigned various problems to solve using MATLAB scripting. Now because each student could work on the experiments on their own rather than creating groups in a lab where usually one student does all the work and the rest of the group doesn't learn much, we had positive feedback. Even a week after the lab session, I was getting messages from students asking for explanations about certain concepts they learned during the lab. To conclude, Simulink, the Simulink implementation of the transformer test was presented today. First, the simplified per phase equivalent circuit was shown and explained. Then the tests were performed in Simulink and sample results were shown. Students engaged in the online lab session and gave positive feedback. We highly recommend this method of teaching engineering concepts through software because most lectures at NAST are still online, even as, to, as of today. And NAST has distance learning centers with no access to lab equipment. This method of teaching should be considered strongly for especially for distance learning centers. With that, I have come to the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening and I'll be happy to answer if there are any questions. Uh, Francis, thank you very much for your presentation. So it's interesting how the current situation and the constraints around public health challenges created new innovations that can be used in the future to support different ways of interacting and learning remotely. So in Uganda, for example, a department within Makerere University has a number of online labs in place for some time over the past decade, and they do remote simulations and it's part of the coursework that the students use these remote simulators. Um, so it would be interesting if the other delegates could share um, via chat if they use online labs for teaching and learning and what their experience is. So you share this knowledge with Francis. And then Francis, from, for a question for you specifically is, um, what particular problems, if any, were experienced using the MATLAB Simulink? And can you briefly present the pros and cons of using such a solution from a career development perspective for the students, despite not being able to learn in a physical lab environment? So I put that into chat as well so you can see it.
Yes. Okay. I've just seen the question in the chat. What practical problems, if any, were experienced using uh, Simulink? Um, really, there wasn't um, much of a problem. The only problem we encountered was that uh, because uh, the scheduling of the lab was done uh, on short notice, um, a lot of students struggled with uh, getting licenses for MATLAB. The university uh, did not provide licenses. So the few students who had licenses had to share with other students who didn't. And unfortunately, some students had to uh, download pirated copies of the software, which is not ideal, but I mean, it, it got the job done. So that was the only uh, uh, problem we had. And then the second part of your question, can you briefly present the pros and cons using solutions from it? Okay, um, learning in a physical laboratory is always uh, the best thing for any student because you get to see things, you get to feel, you get to touch. Uh, that is the best way to, to gain experience. Uh, teaching with a software lab is just to understand the concepts of uh, the topic we are covering, basically. Do you want to add anything? Okay. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And then how much effort was required to put the lab in place? So you said it was done at short notice because it was a direct response to the situation of not being able to go into the physical lab. So how much yes. time did it take for the researchers to put the lab in place? That'd be useful for other departments to know. Um, it didn't take much, probably uh, just about two weeks, because um, first we had to do the test on the uh, actual transformer and gathered the, the parameters needed to model that transformer in Simulink. Once you've done the test on the physical transformer and you have all the data, uh, setting it up in Simulink is just a matter of how good you are with Simulink. So it, it doesn't take long. Thank you. And then one of the recommendations you made was that NUST considered um, using this going forward. So have you received any response to how these um, online labs could be used as part of the curriculum to learn specific concepts and to allow students to practice on their own outside class time and physical labs? Uh, no, not yet. But uh, I, I believe Professor James will uh, continue to use this lab that we've developed uh, for future cohorts of students. Yeah, well, that's good because it's very important when you put effort in place and when you get a positive response that it doesn't become a white elephant, that it's actually used as much as it can be used and modified over time. So that's very positive. Um, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge. So hopefully the other delegates will share experiences they've had from other countries, but I don't see any information in chat at the moment. So now, thank you very much. We'll move on to the next presentation. All right, thank you. So now Teresia, Jude and Martin will present learning analytic tools for enhancing students' performance, a global perspective. Okay, good day. My name is uh, Ms. Teresia Ankome, a lecturer at Namibia University of Science and Technology. I'll be presenting our paper, our research, uh, learning analytic tools for enhancing students' performance, uh, which is a, go a, a global perspective. Uh, it is written by Dr. Jude Osakwe, Dr. Gloria Iawa. We are both from the Namibia University of Science and Technology, and Dr. Martin Jakpa, which is uh, the senior lecturer and head of the Department for Computer Science at uh, Ghana Communication Technology University. All right, so I'll be presenting our work. 
uh, with us, we are going to be discussing mainly the motivation that enables us to write this or do the research, the problem area, research objectives, research methodology based on our learning analytic applications and tools, major outcomes and results that we have came across, uh, the discussion briefly on our research conclusion and outlook and the ref some of the references that we have came across too. So despite minerals benefit of learning analytics, uh, higher institutional ed institu higher educational institutions are faced with challenges of determining how to capture, analyze, store, and use data to achieve better performance in our institution. Highest whereby we experience high or we have observed uh, high student dropout, the increasing rate of these students being transferred to other universities because of these cases. Um, high educational institutions still use of conventional mode of data collection analysis, hence making it difficult for them to arrive at a decision. It's a death of empirical studies ascertaining on how learning analytics can be used in high educational institutes to enhance students' performance from a global perspective in real time, thereby reducing their chances of enhancing their students' performances. Uh, the research objectives, uh, high educational institutes will highly benefit from this research in the sense that it will, it will assist these high educational institutes to incorporate some of these learning analytics strategies into their teaching method in order to ensure a smooth transmission of knowledge to their students based on their, their required needs. The study will further discuss various learning analytic tools and applications and their impact on students' academic performance worldwide. Um, the learning analytics, which is an emerging field, combines mathematical and stat statistical modeling, data visualization, and information system. Considering the fact that the majority of educational data is from students, one of the major sources where data could be collected from is M, learning management system. The learning management system contains student profile engagement, interactive activities, as well as hidden data from students' successes and failures. So with an analytic learning analytic process, interrelationship, we have uh, made use of this diagram to derive our information. So we have the student data, teacher mentor and data, and student data, the monitoring, which also from this monitoring, we have the prediction, intervention, analysis, and reflection from our results. From there, we further have intervention, tutoring and mentoring can be from the lecturer or supervisors, uh, assessments, uh, adaptation of these tools, personalization, then the feedback is derived from all these dependents. So these are some of the tools that various universities across the world use. We have the monitoring and analytic tool for e-learning platform, the Moodle watchdog, which is a log analysis for the learning management system model. We have the student acti act, uh, activity meta, uh, the e-learning platform, our university, which is Namibia University of Sci Namibia University of Science and Technology, we are currently making use with our students. It's going so far so well. And other tools that are listed here are used by various universities ac across the world. So the quantitative, our our research is a quantitative study which is covered within or covered by 12 countries or participants from 12 countries. We have from Nigeria, uh, Namibia, United States of America, Australia, Canada, Germany, Ghana, Kenya, South Africa, United Kingdom, India, and Finland. So there is no specific um, connection to why we choose this country. We just wanted to have a broad idea and you cannot cover the whole world at this stage, but we have managed to cover some of these countries just to make it a worldwide research. So data was collected using online survey questionnaires. Uh, a global a geographical spread of this country made an online survey very suitable to tools for researchers considering the fact that participants are from five continents in the world to ensure diversity in this research. Uh, the survey which made use of sample data 
of around 2,000 participants was collected from 1,395, contributing to a response rate of around 65.63 percentage. The questionnaires uh, or the questions are arranged in a link like scale. The survey took over six weeks to complete. So the 1,395 among them were lecturers that participated in it. Data was analyzed for interactive statistics through the use of statistical package for social science, sciences, SPSS, okay? So on our outcome, we also experienced that a high experience of this learning analytic was the above or the high rate was recorded from 10 years and above, which had 60.8 percentage presently. Then with the institution, we have realized university recorded a vast usage as compared to colleges and polytechnics with the university coming up to at least the usage rate of being around 68.70 percentage usage in various universities across the world. Uh, does they, we also made uh, use of questions such as, does you does your institution use learning analytic tools? So the, we came up with the yes answer of around 52 participant percentages, of 52 percentage that acknowledge that their university make use of these learning analytics. 26% uh, of the respondents were not sure, and we have 21 that gave a definite answer that they do not make use of these learning analytics at their institution. Uh, the vast usage of these learning analytics tool, according to our research, we found out that computer science departments across various universities make use, has the highest recorded in making use of these learning analytics. And the least one we have uh, agriculture, education, physical science, and political science that made less, where we recorded around 1% usage on these learning analytic tools. So here are some of the questions that we also made use when carrying out our research and just finding out further about the learning analytic tools that were being used in various universities across the world. So we also had a discussion from the analysis. It is clear that lecturers have diverse views about the learning analytic. Some of the lecture or most of them, a majority of the lecture were aware of the benefit that uh, learning analytics have in area of monitoring student progress and enhancing uh, the student's performance. The challenge of lack of resources such as human and finance were also highlighted by some of the participants that showed it was the downfall of why some of the universities were not making use or making more use of these learning analytics where there were just few uh, uh, less skilled in this area. Resources also revealed that the lecturers are at of the view that this feedback from the learning analytics will go a long way in promoting academic excellence and professional skills development. However, they also have the lack of differentiating between various learning analytic tools. However, the usage of learning analytic tools in high educational institute provided such outcomes that uh, about 31% of lecturers make use of nude uh, models while the use of learning management system came around at 27%, and around 12% of the lecturers that make use of TWU and 9% make use of what the tool that we make, we call WooClap at the institution. Though we still have a 21% of lecturers that indicated that we're not sure of the learning analytic tools that they use by the institution, that they are there, it means they are there, but they don't really use them. So these tools of, of which learning tools are, situated, are suited or suitable for them, all right? So further, this uh, implementation of learning uh, analytic tools were also based on policies that different universities have differ. So when it comes in terms of data collection method and privacy, this was some of the implication that some of the university Phase. These policies are used to determine how data is collected, stored, analyzed, and used, which are, as you are saying, they are very according to different geographical location as well and universities. So these policies might be different, preventing 
a better use of learning analytical tools in university. So around 72% of the lecturers that were interviewed stated that it would be difficult to adapt learning analytics in their institution due to their institutional policies. Okay, therefore the policy will guide and and guard data usage are imperative in all higher educational institution. If learning analytics is to be adapted and used, so they have to re, we are advising them to redraft these policies that bring implication when it comes to the adaptation or usage of learning analytics tools in universities. Uh, some lecturers in high educational institution are ready to use, or most of them are ready to use the learning analytical tools for predicting students' performance and they believe the learning analytics to enhance productivity in their institutions as well. The high educational institutions have an enormous amount of data in their disposal that can, they can make use to also benefit them and their students. The ability to enhance and make use of this data is to inform classroom data to inform classroom activity, whether it is face to face or online. The main thrust is the making use of these learning analytic tools. The learning analytic tools has the potential to monitor student progress, boast academic excellence as well. The decision to use these tools, the learning analytic tools is strongly associated with the, both individual needs, interest and trust with uh, institutional capacity, the readiness to create an environment in which these tools are valued, encouraged and become part of the organizational context. It's highly recommended. If learning analytic tools adaptation is desired by institution, they will also commute to building trust and providing support and reward for faculty as well as advisors. The high educational institution should do all it takes to ensure that these learning analytic tools are adapted for the use of their institution. So these are some of the reference, some of the few references that we have came across or made use of. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, we are leaving the floor for any questions, suggestion, or comments that you have for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I've put the questions and the feedback into the chat so Jude and Martin can see it as we're going along. So it's impressive that this study had respondents from 12 countries and to provide the other researchers who may be interested in doing a very broad focused um, surveys in the future, could you please provide further insight into the following questions? So. Of the 12 countries, uh, Teresa mentioned in her presentation that there was no specific reason for these countries, but it would be useful to clarify whether the countries were specifically targeted, as in the, respond, the participants that you targeted initially were from these countries, or these countries simply uh, reflect the country of the respondents. And then linked with that, how were the 2000 participants targeted and engaged with, and over what time was the survey undertaken and when? Thank you. Okay, Ma Ma Martin here, let me respond and then Dr. Sake can come in. I know he's, uh, he mentioned to me a few minutes ago, he was involved in another meeting, but let me take this. And then if he's around, he can respond to it. I know he's around. So uh, in terms of uh, uh, population, the participants, uh, our focus was on uh, getting, trying to cover as much geographical location as possible because we wanted to get a varied uh, view on uh, learning analytics uh, from uh, lecturers in terms of uh, how it is, uh, how they are using that to uh, understand or uh, get some insight into the data, the enormous large amount of data sets that is available to them in their institutions. So we initially, what even the 12 countries you mentioned, we didn't, we're not uh, targeting 12 countries. We wanted to go as wide as possible. So we, we actually sent out our instrument to more than those 12 countries, but the responses that you got are, is the 12 countries that we got responses from. So it is the those 12 countries you are seeing there. It's not because we targeted only the 12, but it's just because those were the 12 that we got responses from. 
and uh, the good thing about it is it gave us do it has some spread but we didn't there was no specific uh, reason for those 12 countries we were looking at just getting a varied view to see how learning analytics across as much geographical uh, area as possible we could get information from then uh, on the time frame we did a uh, no on the 2000 uh, participants yeah, we're looking at uh, getting a minimum of responses from about uh, 2,000 uh, participants within the period that we had uh, defined the research in. But within that period, we could only get up to about 1,300 and something participants. Uh, maybe if I want to be specific, we got up to about 1,395 participants. We were not able to hit the minimum of the 2,000 uh, participants. We wanted to also see how varied or how wide were the responses or how close were these responses from uh, these varied uh, participants. Then uh, in terms of uh, how learning, okay, uh, the, in terms of the period, uh, it, took, it took us a six month period to collect uh, that data. Then uh, in terms of uh, learning analytics using NAST, uh, <laughs> but you can't answer on behalf of NOST. So if you can talk broadly about, from your experience, what learning analytical tools are used in Namibia or Ghana? Okay, in terms of uh, learning analytical tools, if you take, uh, if you take uh, the, let's take our learning uh, management system, where most uh, institutions uh, here in Ghana and in Namibia are making use of uh, uh, the Moodle platform, because it's more of an open source, many institutions have gone in for that instead and are uh, using their local expertise to support that. What happens is uh, based on the students' uh, various uh, feedbacks that uh, the, or the various students' uh, activities that are carried in, in, in there, it has some built-in uh, analytics and tools in there, which when you uh, run, uh, when you do some running of it, it is able to give you all kinds of uh, uh, data visualization for you to see uh, in terms of the different activities, what the various uh, activity students have been involved in or what various activities students have stayed away from, which all kinds of inferences could have been drawn from. So uh, Ghana and Namibia, the uh, Moodle platform, which uh, most of them used to uh, build their learning management system has an input in analytic tool that uh, we drew uh, lessons from during this uh, Okay, thank you. And then, so that by inference would suggest that when some of the respondents said that they didn't know what learning analytic tools their institution was using, that was lack of awareness of what their learning management system had. So it, it reflects that they need more training in the functionality of their existing learning management system. That is, that is correct. And additionally, again, the challenge also had to do with the policy issues because uh, some of the institutions were if you look at their policies it was a bit relaxed in terms of uh, pulling data to perform all kinds of analysis but others were a bit stiffer in terms of going through some kind of approvals structural uh, uh, systems to get approval to actually do that and so some of some of the some of the lecturers felt there was no need that was an additional way for them to be able to even understand some details. But where it was more relaxed, actually, where more lecturers were actually engaged in trying to perform those learning analytics. Thank you very much. And then the last aspect is from the survey findings, was there anything that popped out that was unexpected? Anything uh, that surprised the research team? Uh, not, I, I don't, the research team, we, I don't recollect us uh, noticing anything that was surprising. Maybe okay. possibly because we did a widespread, maybe if we do some focusing in the future, probably, but we didn't, there were no surprises. Okay, thank you very much. I don't see any other questions for you in chat. So thank you very much for the presentation. I'd like to thank all the presenters for the preparation done before the session and for your interaction during the session and the delegates who interacted in the questions. So we're going to take a short break now and in a few minutes, we'll start the next session, which is focused on societal implications of technology. So thank you very much.